Uh, Darren Moore is an old friend of ours. Who's a stranger? Uh, most of us knew Darren. He's not a from. stranger. We haven't seen him in a long time. He, he kind of slipped out of sight after the 2004 election, and he became a conservative instead of a Republican. And uh, probably you have to be a conservative to know the difference. Uh, Darren, you have the floor. I have a, just a couple prepared remarks. And then my intention is to just kind of visit with you about the man that Russell Kirk is. I'm curious, how many of you have read a book by Russell Kirk one time or another in your life? <coughs> I know Torian's here, so I know he's read at least Prudence. How many of you have heard of Russell Kirk? Okay. I'm glad to see, and this is uh, this is actually the fact that half of you have heard of Russell Kirk is frankly surprising. Even here in Michigan, most of the, the people that we encounter have no clue who Russell Kirk is, even though he is Michigan's own. So let me let me uh, let me start by plagiarizing one of our faculty members, Brad Berger, who holds the Russell Kirk chair at Hillsdale College, uh, as he in one of his essays describes Russell Kirk as maybe one, if not the most important American thinkers of the 20th century. He was a historian, a literary biographer, a political biographer, a best-selling novelist, a social critic and essayist, a defender of academic freedom, an economist, an advisor to presidents, and an advisor to presidential candidates, a Roman Catholic, a Stoic, a Christian humanist, a convinced believer in ghosts, a nationally known debater and lecturer, a traditionalist, an environmentalist, conservationist, a, a justice of the peace, the founder of post-World War II conservative movement, and perhaps above all, a truly charitable soul. In short, Russell Kirk was a man of letters, a natural aristocrat, both being rare to nearly extinct in the 20th century. Don't you love how he just sneaks in that? He was also the founder of the American conservative movement, amongst all of those things. In 1953, Russell uh, had published the book, The Conservative Mind. And this began the conservative movement as we know it here in America today. Before Russell reclaimed the term conservative, <coughs> we were simply known as the losing side, <laughs> or what some called the, the idiot party. But what Russell did with this book um, was really to show the long tradition of uh, great intellectual thinkers running all the way back to the founder of conservatism, as Russell saw it, uh, Edmund Burke. How many of you have heard of Edmund Burke? Okay. Great. <clears throat> Russell finishes his uh, introduction to the conservative mind, again written in 1953, by saying this. That if the conservative order is to indeed return, we ought to know what tradition is attached to it, so that way we so that way we may rebuild society. If it is not to be restored, we still ought to understand the conservative ideas, so that way we may rake from the ashes what scorched fragments of civilization escape the conflagration or destructive fire of unchecked will and appetite. In other words, sometimes civilizations burn right to the ground, don't they? Yeah. We've seen great empires rise and fall. What Russell was most concerned with was making sure that there was a, as we, as we, if we think back to what 1953 was, in 1953 we were going through some amazing changes. The liberal, uh, and uh, not only the, the progressive liberal of the 20th century, but the classical liberal was, was having difficulty coming to terms with this incredible upheaval that had taken place. I mean, over 160 million people were killed by their own governments in the 20th century. And so, as Lord Acton might say, that the greatest opportunity ever given to mankind was thrown away because the, the desire and passion for freedom made vain, or excuse me, the desire and passion for equality made vain the hope for freedom. We see this today in America where people care more about egalitarianism and, and social justice rather than caring about equal treatment under the law, equal justice, blind justice, what people care about on the left particularly today is social justice, which begins with 
as it cuts the legs out from underneath real justice, begins with the idea, instead of treating people differently, and treating them equal, un unequal initially, as opposed to giving everybody equal justice. So this is the, the political climate into which Russell's book landed like a bombshell. And the, the political movement from that point forward, uh, the conservative movement, began to get its legs. And uh, of course in 1964 we began to see its, its first flourishings with the, uh, with the candidacy of Barry Goldwater. And they say that Barry Goldwater won the election, it just took him 16 years to count all the votes. <laughs> and so 16 years later Ronald Reagan brings the whole conservative flourishing to its greatest manifestation is elected essentially three times to office because one must consider that H.W.'s election is really a ratification of, of uh, Ronald Reagan's conservatism. And so, um, what was Russell? Russell was born, surprisingly, well, for people have called him uh, the American Cicero, the person that I quoted, um, the Russell Kirk chair from Hillsdale College, wrote two books that are worth reading. I know there are some Catholics in here. How many, how many other Catholics are there? How many of you have heard of Christopher Dawson? Chris, great. Christopher Dawson is one of the greatest um, Catholic minds one would ever study. And he was, a, he was quite a mentor to, uh, and, uh, to Russell. But also, um, Brad Berzer, again, the chairman of, who holds the Russell Kirk Chair at Hillsdale School, wrote this wonderful book called American Cicero about the life and times of James Carroll. And a lot of folks don't realize just how badly Catholics were treated at the time of our founding. It's really amazing to read about this often overlooked founding. But the, the reason I point out this book, The American Cicero, is because that is also what Russell has been called, the heir to uh, Edmund Burke or to Cicero from, from ancient Rome. He's also, Russell has also been called the sage of Macosta. Macosta, Michigan is the Kirk ancestral home about 25 miles west of Mount Pleasant. It's a little town in which they know whose check's good and whose husband is. It must be like 2,000, 2,500 people is all that live there. And on top of the hill in the town is, uh, is called Piety Hill, is the home on which Russell Kirk uh, raised his family. And just down the street is his library that used to be an old woodshed, uh, an old barn, a wood, wood making barn. And it's now full of books I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, Russell was actually born in Plymouth, Michigan. He was the son of a railroad engineer. They say that he was born on the wrong side of the tracks in Plymouth. And uh, he went on to Michigan State University, got his bachelor's there, a school that he would later call Behemoth University. And he would also call it Cow College when he was teaching as a professor there. He uh, went on to get his uh, Master's of History at Duke University and then further graduate studies at St. Andrews in Scotland, where he still to this day holds the, the distinction as the only American that has the Doctor of Man of Letters, uh, quite a prestigious double major that he earned in St. Andrews. And while he was writing his thesis, essentially, which was bringing together all of the great minds from Burke all the way to T.S. Eliot and George Santana and Irving Babbitt, and so many of these other great writers that Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh probably have never heard of, that um, uh, while Russell was writing this, they found that although he was a very shy man, he was introduced to Henry Regnery, who ultimately published The Conservative Mind, when he, when he said that uh, you know, Russell's a very, sh a very silent man. He's, very, he's a very shy man. And he's a bit of a freak of a ne nature because he's the son of a railroadsman. But when he gets behind the typewriter, the results are most impressive. During Russell's life, he wrote 29 books. He edited 30 others. I have, um, he, he wrote some fiction. I have not read any of his fiction. I have the books that I, and I haven't actually read all of these. I just got to Redeeming the Time last week, which is a collection of essays, surprisingly enough. But um, once one, be, Russell sometimes is very difficult to explain, but he's actually very easy to understand in most of his books. A lot of folks will pick up the conservative mind, which is an outstanding read, and become uh, very, uh, they find it very unapproachable. And often you will need a dictionary to get through uh, his very, very complex ideas. Now, if you were looking to approach Russell for the first time, I would recommend, as would 
his lovely uh, widow, Mrs. Kirk, and met Kirk, as well as all the senior Kirkian scholars, would suggest that you start with the politics of prudence. The politics of prudence is, in many ways, his swan song. All of his greatest essays, the distillation and constant sifting process of all of his work were broken down into some very approachable essays. And so I would recommend that every person begin their, uh, uh, um, their discovery of Russell Kirk by reading The Politics of Prudence. If you're not going to use that, I would recommend that you start with The American Cause. In fact, The American Cause, written in 1957, was in many regards a, a response to the, well, not in many regards, exactly a response to the fact that Russell became so um, disappointed in how easily so many of our POWs during the Korean War were, were able to be co-opted to communism. They didn't know what they were fighting for. And so Russell wrote this book for the, well, frankly, the high schooler, the GI kind of person. And so this book uh, does a wonderful job of explaining what the heck is the American cause. And so I would point out that in the American cause, he says that the cause of the America's cause is the cause of true human nature, enlightened order, regular justice, and liberty under law. When we talk about human nature, uh, as many of the great conservative writers do, the conservative is convinced that human nature is fixed, that it's not this malleable thing, that we're not just putting in the hands of whomever our leaders may be at the time, but rather um, that human nature is fixed because it was given to us by God. And so uh, when we look back to the first writings of history, whether that be Homer or Hesiod, 2,500 years ago, they were still writing about the same challenges, the same types of things that we moderns contemplate. So you don't have to believe in Greek gods to see the truth in Homer. There is a reason why these great books have endured. Why Shakespeare, Shakespeare's only a, a small fraction of the age of, of some of the writings of the, of the Greeks, the ancients, and yet, this, this still, they're still the same types of issues that we face today. So there's three things that I want to share with you here today, essentially about Russell Kirk. The, uh, Russell took upon himself the, the goal of, no, let me explain it to you using Russell's words. That, well, let, let me, just in the essence of time here, let me just skip right to it. One of the, one of the, key, one of the key arguments that Russell made in his life was against ideology. Ideology. Ideology, as Russell saw it, was, well, let me quote uh, Thaddeus McConnell, uh, our, our, the, the congressman from the adjacent uh, congressional district. Congressman McConnell, by the way, is having a book published by Intercollegiate Studies Institute about these very conservative, uh, conservative roots. And McConnell said that the difference between ideology and philosophy is this. Philosophy is about um, getting your mind to fit with the world. In other words, you look at the world as its reality, and then you try to fit your mind to it. Now, others have said that philosophy is really just the preparation for death, but it is the, still the idea of learning the way the life is and developing truths, these eternal verities, teasing out of life the great conversations, the things that endure, the things that are true. On the other hand, ideology is the exact opposite of philosophy. Instead of trying to fit our mind to the world, ideology tries to make the world fit to our mind. It becomes a, a rigid set of dogma, a doctrine of, of checkpoint ideas that um, the, in, in, in defense of these, these dogma, these certain concepts, uh, I should say that uh, the ideologue looks at government as a revolutionary instrument that can eliminate all the suffering, solve all of the problems. The planners believe that if we just are faithful to a certain set of dogma, that all the problems will go away. Of course, history shows us that the same problems are going to exist. We cannot eliminate all suffering. And so the ideologue, on the other hand, takes a, gets rid of religion and replaces it with a sham religion, thinking that perhaps if we're just a little bit more tinkering, we can solve all of the world's problems. Um, the conservative, on, and Russell said, 
quoting H. Stuart Hughes, that conservatism is not an ideology. Conservatism is the negation of ideology, the negation of ideology. In other words, we're not an ideology because a conservative is um, a led and guided in the world by the lamp of experience. It's that the conservative brings together all of our best of traditions, the best ideas that have worked. And if they don't, if there's, if there's truths that can assail them, then they're discarded. So the conservative allows his ideas to, to be held up to the lamp of scrutiny and attacked on all sides. And so these traditions, these things that have, have endured, are what the conservative calls the permanent things. Has anybody heard this term before, the permanent things? Of course, we have a centurion graduate in the back of the room who is raising his hand and winking at me all the way through it. So it's good to see you again, Toro. Um, the permanent things. The permanent things are the things that have been ratified by the entire human experience. Again, we were talking about how the conservative is willing to, to subject his ideas to his principles to scrutiny. The conservative brings together, ties together, stitches together all these great traditions. Um, and, and so when we talk about the ideologies, where do we get our ideas? Where do we get our permanent things? Well, Russell wrote a book, <laughs> a rather large one, called The Roots of American Order, which has a really magnificent thesis to it. The idea is that the American order really is not American at all. In fact, that the, the American uh, uh, tree, let's call it, actually has four main roots that has, have given us our permanent things, our great traditions. The first root, the tap root, comes from Jerusalem, from the Jews. The Ten Commandments were revelation, and it changed the way the world thought. I mean, think about the dramatic, the dramatic change in the way humans uh, existed with one another with the Ten Commandments. Before the Ten Commandments, human sacrifice was common. In fact, everybody thought that's the way that you appease the gods. That's just one monumental, excuse me, one monumental paradigm shift that took place because of the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments and the Jewish tradition, the tap root of American, uh, of our, of American order, is essentially the ordering of the soul, is what, or what the Jews taught us. That's the first root. The second root comes from ancient, ancient Greece, the, Ath the Athenians. The ordering, if the Jerusalem was the ordering of the soul, the A Athens was the ordering of the mind. So Socrates and Plato and Aristotle taught us and began this pursuit uh, of, of, of what is the nature of the good? What is the nature of thought? And ultimately we, we, we see the philosophy continuing to build upon one, on one another all through history. The third root, I should point out that neither Jerusalem uh, or the Jews and, and neither did the, Gre the Grecians really give us any kind of guide regarding our, our politics. Perhaps the Greeks taught us how not to do it by showing us that <laughs> democracy really is, like Jefferson might have said, really nothing more than two, two wolves and a lamb deciding what's for dinner. Here in America, liberty is the well-armed lamb contesting the vote. So the, the Grecians... And, and boy, that's a really funny line I just delivered really badly. But uh, you, you guys, if you, you work that timing out, it'll work for you, I'm sure. So um, the, the Grecians taught us how not to do it. The Jews helped us organize our soul. The Grecians taught us to organize our mind. The third, the third root is uh, the Romans. The Romans taught us the rule of law. They began to actually constitute these republics. The Roman virtue. The manly Roman virtue, which said that you must be true to your, your country, to your family. Family was a big thing. And of course, we look at Rome in many ways as a parallel to the same types of things, the same types of decadence, the same types of uh, destructive decay of our values that we can look at Rome and see many of the same parallels that we see here today. That's the third route. The fourth route is London, because London was in many regards the flourishing of all these together. It's this, the German forests and uh, all of this medieval time coming together best manifested in the city of London, where the idea of constitutional law and common law were all brought together in a way that gave man rights. Uh, and freedom and liberty for the first time was really flourishing since the 
since the, since the Roman Empire. And of course then, uh, the fifth country is Philadelphia. And all of, these, all of these great traditions of Western civilization are brought together at a time when, in a, on a found country, our framers, who were not philosophers, but they were familiar with philosophy, they were statesmen who had a great deal of their own experience because England had, uh, had afforded our, us as a colony a salutary neglect, which allowed us to control our own affairs. And so remember, it's very important to point out that the, the framers of our Constitution, our, our, our founders, really thought that the whole, the whole independence thing was about reclaiming our rights as Englishmen. And that was the, the thing that spurred the fight. However, obviously, these men uh, had an opportunity, unlike any other peoples ever in history, to have, now they not only had their own freedom, but they had the ability to look back through history and see what didn't work and be able to construct their own constitution, their own way of, their own way of living. <clears throat> what kind of order would we have? On what things would we base our constitution? And that, of course, is the thing. You know, what happened in Philadelphia? We got our own constitution. The rest, as they say, is history. However, as Russell Kirk will point out, that beneath any formal constitution, beneath any written document or system of justice, there exists a unwritten constitution of traditions and customs and conventions that, uh, that are, like Edmund Burke would say, the little platoons, the little authorities of life. These clubs, the groups, the faith, the school, the community, all of these smaller organizations which naturally form the fabric which upholds our formal documents. And so that's, let me finish by, so I was talking, when I asked him, I said, well, you know, what kind of folks will I be speaking with here tonight? We mentioned that that often there's a lot, there's some seniors involved, and I'm glad to see that there's a couple, well, there's, there's two seniors. Everybody has a question. Let me finish with, uh, again, with Brad Berger, with whom I started. Brad, Brad wrote a wonderful essay, and you all should check out the uh, imaginativeconservative.com. It's an unbelievably wonderful site. It's, it's, sometimes they talk over my head, but uh, they really do some beautiful writing. And Russell knew, and let me close by saying that, Russell knew that while all of the virtues work together, it is love, the greatest of virtues, that holds the rest together. In one of the most beautiful paragraphs ever composed in the, in the entirety of the 20th century, a, a, a century driven by blood, ideologies, and technology, Russell Kirk wrote this. At the back of every discussion of the good society lies this question. What is the object of human life? The enlightened conservative does not believe that the end or aim of life is competition or success or enjoyment or longevity or power or possessions. The enlightened conservative believes instead that the object of life is love. He knows that the just and ordered society is that in which love governs us. So far as love ever can reign in this world of sorrows, and he knows that the, anarch the anarchical and tyrannical society, anarchical. anarchical and tyrannical society, is that in which love lies corrupt. He has learned that love is the source of all being, and that hell itself is ordained by love. Love, he understands, um, he understands that death, when we have finished the part that was assigned to each and every one of us, is the reward Death is the reward of love. And he apprehends the truth that the greatest happiness ever granted to a man is the privilege of being happy in the hour of his death. Russell was a man that knew a lot about love. He had a lot of love in his life. And Russell would also be one of the types of folks that would never, would never say that the, the type of screaming that we see in today's political discourse is... Um, becoming more like the animals rather than the better angels of our nature. And so Russell's prescription would be, of course, when we are talking to our political opponents, that 
Start first trying with love. Because as Gandhi said, that if you have the truth on your side, begin with love, or else the message in the messenger will be uh, dismissed. But don't forget also that Gloria Simon said that the truth will set you free, but first it will take you off. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Two or three. If you say anything, I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah, you had mentioned, uh, Mr. Kirk, you had written a book about the Korean War. He did not write a book about the Korean War. Or oh, during the Korean during War. He wrote the American cause um, in a response to the fact that the GIs from the Korean War were not able, the POWs were not able to articulate and were so easily converted to, to communism. So it was a writing in response to the Korean War as opposed to actually writing about it. Does he say anything about, you know, I have always been opposed to Harry Truman removing General MacArthur because I've always believed that General MacArthur is right because if MacArthur was able to go ahead, there would be one Korean Peninsula today and we wouldn't have that Kim Jong-il and those communists there. Does he mention yeah, that? That's a great question. He does mention it. I, I think that I will take a pass on this question okay. because simply because I understand the difference between a pseudo-scholar like myself and a real scholar. Okay. And so I would just really hate to lead you astray uh, on a, a question that really ought to be given to a Kirkian scholar. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the Jewish uh, heritage and the Greeks, the Romans, and London. Um, where, where, does, uh, where does Christianity fit into uh, Mr. Kirk's? It's a great question. And it's actually a bit of an oversight on my part. Um, because I, I didn't, um, and this is, of course, in many regards, Christopher Dawson is the intellectual, intellectual heir to St. Augustine. And what St. Augustine did uh, in ancient Roman times was in many ways to sanctify the pagan and bring him into the fold of, of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So uh, when in, in trying to uh, point out the four roots of American order, I, I kind of said it is everything after Rome was Christendom. The, from the German forest to the, to, to the, the French decadence of Paris and to, to England, we were essentially for, from, you know, the, from Christ's death until the American founding, the Western, the Western civilization has been predominantly Christian. And so the writings of Thomas Aquinas, the writings of, uh, of Augustine came together in many regards and in large uh, thanks to uh, England. And so Christendom factors in all of this, but of course, uh, when we talk about the Jews, we, we kind of also point out that, yeah, well, that's a root. Jerusalem in and of itself is where Christ's from. So uh, I'm very glad you brought that what up. About, what about Calvin? <laughs> what about Calvin? <laughs>